being that we have a majority of the town council present, I'm going to call the committee of the whole together and then turn it over at, excuse me, at 6.30 and turn it over to Andy Steinberg, who is chair of the Finance Committee. And I call the Finance Committee to order and uh, welcome all of you who have come to the public hearing of the Council Finance Committee to consider the uh, fiscal year 20 budget, which was submitted by the town manager to the council on May 1st. Um, the hearing is required by the town charter. More importantly, it's an opportunity for the Finance Committee um, and the council, since uh, most of the council is here, as well as the town manager, to hear about your questions, your concerns, and your priorities regarding the budget. The budget is a state of your priorities. The charter provides in section 5.5 that immediately upon receiving the proposed budget from the town manager, the council shall refer the budget to the town council's finance committee. It goes on to say, and I quote, the Finance Committee shall hold a public hearing on the proposed budget, providing no less than 10 days notice of such hearing. The Finance Committee will thoroughly review the budget and make a presentation and recommendation to the full town council within 30 days of referral. Close quote. The Finance Committee has been meeting twice weekly and has heard from the town manager, superintendent of schools, library directors, and the heads of the town departments to fully understand the proposed budget and how it will continue the important services upon which all of us rely. The, um, these are the portions of the budget that support the operations of town government. On Thursday, May 23rd, which is uh, tradition today, the committee will consider the proposed capital plan and will hear from the chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee about its proposal for the use of Community Preservation Act funds. While this is a separate process, it is also an allocation of funds raised by taxation and state allocation that, supporter, um, that supports what the town can do for residents. Finance Committee will hear comments um, on the expenditures proposed by the Community Preservation Act Committee at this hearing, but the committee recommendations and council actions are a separate process uh, from the action required on the budget under Article 5. Just so you know, the hearing is going to go in the following process, and then I'll turn it over to the town manager. The town manager is going to start with the formal presentation and description of his proposed budget. We'll hear questions, if there are any further questions from the councillors. Uh, the councillors have heard a presentation previously, but if there are questions from the councillors, uh, entertain them. This is a process, by the way, that's outlined in the charter. Members of the public, all of you, will be able to ask questions about the proposed budget um, and the Finance Committee and the Town Manager will attempt to answer questions. We'll then um, do a slightly different thing after getting questions, which is we will then welcome you to speak um, in favor or um, in, uh, about your concerns about the proposed budget or any particular section. Um, after um, that process, uh, you'll have an opportunity um, uh, to hear from uh, further questions from the counselors who can ask questions to clarify what they've heard because we want to make sure that all of us here um, understand what you bring forward to us so that I want to give the counselors that opportunity. Uh, and uh, then I'll ask if there are any further questions uh, or comments that you may have to offer. Uh, the Finance Committee uh, will not be taking any, <coughs> excuse me, will not be taking any action on the budget tonight. This is really about listening and uh, in responding to the extent that we can. Uh, the, uh, 
I anticipate that the Finance Committee will vote on its recommendations to the full council at its meeting on May 28th. That's, that's on, on the budget as a whole, not on the Community Preservation Act. That may be on, is likely to be on a separate date because we need to deliver our report to the council about the budget as a whole um, on June 3rd. Um, there is a requirement that we act on the budget separately and before we act on um, those, the, the additional piece, which is the Community Preservation Act. Um, so, um, and during the uh, meetings of the Council and of the Finance Committee, there always is the opportunity, they're open to the public, and there always is an opportunity for public comment. And I guess my last uh, uh, statement, and this is for people who are watching at home too, who won't have the opportunity tonight to offer their thoughts, but hopefully they will be um, thinking of things that they wish they had asked. And if they do, um, they can send them to us. Um, they can send it to me as the chair of the Finance Committee, and I'll forward it to the Finance Committee, um, Steinberg A at AmherstMA.gov, or we can send it to the council, um, the town council address to get to the attention of the entire town council in one um, hit of a send button. And I think that's town council at so with that um, introduction, I want to turn it over to Mr. Bachelman. Uh Thank you, Councillor Steinberg. My name is Paul Bachelman. I hope you can hear me. I'll talk as loud as I can. If you can't, just wave your arms in a wild way, and I'll try to speak louder. Um, I want to thank the Council and the Finance Committee in particular for accepting this presentation tonight. Uh, I did a similar presentation, but not the exact presentation a little while ago. I'm joined by Sonia Aldridge, who is our interim finance director and the comptroller. Also, Margaret Nardowitz, who is the clerk to the council and the town council. Everybody wears multiple hats uh, in town hall. Uh, we're happy to be uh, recorded by Amherst Media, uh, and this will be rebroadcast later. And um, this this uh, presentation will be uploaded to the budget page, and it's been emailed to uh, the council if you want to follow along. Um, any budget and any presentation like this is not just my name is on there, but it's really a team effort. And it starts with Sonia, she really leads the way. We have a care capable people in Maria Rocca, uh, Holly Bowser, uh, and on our staff in Town Hall, who've been really pivotal in developing the budget. Uh, there, the, this budget, is, as I pr will present, also includes the schools and the library. So in the school department, Mike Morris and Sean Mangano were the ones who built that budget. Um, Sharon Sherry, the director of library, built that budget. Uh, two school committees have reviewed their budgets. The library trustees have reviewed the, their budget. It all started last year, 2018, when the select board and the finance committee back then uh, set ground rules and guidelines for how I should build this budget. And then for the month of May, the finance committee has been meeting twice a week to review every element of this budget with every department head in the town. So I just want to go through what's included and what, and this, this idea is to provide you a full financial picture for the town. And the thing we're going to be talking about most tonight is the municipal budget. That's the one that, that we're really focused on. The elementary school budget has, uh, is also part of the vote, but that's been presented by the, through the school committee, to the school committee, and then through the school committee to the finance committee. The library budget, again, through the library trustees, uh, by the director and to the finance committee. The regional school budget has already been acted on by the, uh, <coughs> by the town council because that had a time sensitive uh, uh, piece to it because of we're in a regional school district and um, we want to get that done earlier so that we're ahead of the other towns who have town meetings. And then we have our capital improvement program and that's sort of a standalone thing. There will be a public forum on that as, as uh, Andy said on June 10th. There are other, two other pieces to this, and that's the Community Preservation Act budget and the Community Development Block Grant budget. I won't be talking about either one of those things tonight. That's not on the agenda for tonight. But that try, I want to make sure you saw the complete financial picture for the town. Um, what's the, the skinny on this? It's, this is a good budget. It maintains solid, our solid financial position, our reserves, 
are at 15.6%, and this is, our goal is to be between five and 15%. The uh, sustains our core services for all of our um, departments, school, library, and town. It doesn't really provide a lot of new stuff, but it doesn't delete a whole lot of stuff. And it increases our capital uh, investment to 9.5% of the tax levy, which is our goal is to get to 10%. We've been going up a half a percent a year. Um, so how did we do this? We, had, we balanced our use of existing revenue from different sources. We don't use any reserves to balance this budget from our um, stabilization fund or our free cash. Those are things that you that are one-time things. And importantly, we are not requesting an operating budget override. You will see other communities who are talking about overrides, which means going to the voters, asking them to tax themselves over and above the allowed 2.5%. We are not doing this for the operating budget of this budget. Um, so we first always start with our budget with revenues. Our property tax revenue we're allowed to increase by 2.5% plus new growth. New growth is when you put on an addition to your house, you, you move, put out, put a new dormer on, the assessors can, in, or the assessors can tax, tax you more because your house is worth more. But the real new growth comes from new construction, new houses being built new buildings downtown, new office buildings. That generates a tremendous amount of new money that comes into the town, and that takes our 2.5% of tax increases up to 4%, and that allows us to meet our needs. Um, we also have local receipts, which is um, motor vehicle excise tax for the most part. And that is something that's driven in pretty much directly by the, the economy, a strong economy, people are buying new cars, that means that the cars have higher value. The, we tax the cars at the value allowed by the state, and that means more money comes in. So you see that going up 5.5%. Uh, state aid is 20% of our budget. It's only going up 1.8%. They're lagging behind. They're not supporting us at the same level that the local taxpayers are all supporting the budget. Water and sewer rates uh, are being proposed to increase by 2.6%. And probably the biggest thing for us this year has been uh, a loss of ambulance revenue of $600,000. This is because we have a, re and I'll talk a little bit more about this, a regional delivery of emergency services. And um, we have, we're providing emergency medical services to the town of Hadley. The town of Hadley decided to go out on their own and contract with a private company uh, because they have their own reasons for it. I won't comment on that. Uh, but that meant that we did not get the contract we had with Hadley, nor did we get the revenue we get because every time we transport someone, we get to bill their provider to collect the ambulance revenue. So we're down $600,000. So that's a, a loss of revenue that is made up by the other increases. So I talked a little bit about um, where the money comes <coughs> from. So property taxes, the blue, that's the, by far the biggest one. Local receipts is the red, the state aid is 20%. And so that's sort of a picture of where our money comes from. We are highly reliant on property tax. That's the people who live in the town, who own property in the town, who are paying taxes to the town. That's why this budget is so important and that's why people should care about it. Um, snapshot of our budget, we break it up into different things. The municipal budget uh, is up 2.8%. Elementary schools up 2.6%, regional schools 2.5%, the tax support of the library is up 2.5%, and so an average of 2.6%. The library is a unique creature. It gets money from uh, the, their trust funds, but they also get tax support, and we treat them, the tax support money, just like any other department, but they, have, they are a, a, their own entity. Um, we also have our capital, of, of over $5 million, which is really important to us. We have required um, commit things that we have to pay for retirement and OPEP. OPEP is other post-employment benefits. So retired municipal employees are entitled uh, contractually for health insurance, certain health insurance payments. We are um, starting to budget for that going to the future that's, that's so that we have money set aside for our future liabilities. And then assessment and others is things that the state tells us that we have to pay for PBTA and things like that. So I want to show you what where our money goes. So um, if you look at the, the 
I'm colorblind, so I'm going to yell out some colors if I'm wrong, Kelly. Um, half of it is schools. That's the red and the green is, is the big piece. So half of our total municipal budget of $83.5 million, $83 million goes to schools. A part of it goes to the, to the town, and then it's other you know, part of it goes to capital, things like that. Um, so the, the big pieces on are what we're spending money on, and uh, we allocated 2.6% average increases to the schools, to the library, and to the town. Um, one of the things that saved us this year, and I'm not going to go into the details, but a year ago we had a health care crisis. The town and the schools and the, and the town of Pelham were all part of a trust. And we self-insured our health insurance for our employees. And that was a very volatile. Sometimes it worked out really well for the town, sometimes it didn't. And we were on a downward uh, slide, and last year we made significant changes uh, working with our collective bargaining units and moved from a self-insured high-risk plan to a fully insured plan. Uh, and so that cost us a lot. The employees gave up a lot of, um, they, there were more deductibles, more shared costs in the program for the employees, which is sort of the reality of what we're all facing today. Um, and we got lower rates. This year it proved to be a good thing because our, our health insurance rate this year went up 0.6%. That's less than 1%. That was, a, that's a, our biggest, uh, other than personnel, our biggest, biggest expense. And that, that saved us this year. That won't happen next year because we're not going to be able to have less than 1% increase in health in the health insurance world. We benefited from this this year. The other things, uh, the, um, the, the other big expense was we wanted to maintain our commitment to putting more money into capital, which is roads, sidewalks, taking care of our buildings, things like that. So then, now now we're moving from we had the the municipal, the, the town, the schools, the library. Now we're just going to look at the town side. And that's what this municipal budget. It, the terms get a little confusing because so we say general government, general fund. We're just calling this the municipal budget. So the general fund is the, all the town operations, and then we have four um, enterprise funds: one for water, one for sewer, one for solid waste, and one for transportation. And so enterprise funds are sort of standalone entities that are like little. They're run like little businesses. They're supposed to um, run their operation, take take on all their expenses. Um, meet all their obligations through the fees that they raise, and that's how we that's how we structure our local government. And those enterprise funds are going up relatively um, a little, or going down. Uh, but the general fund is, is the large number by far. So as we look at what we spend our money on, the by far, we're a people business. Uh, we spend our money on people and on benefits for people. That's the red and the blue. The operating part of, of our budget is 15%. So there's not if you. So when we start talking about budget reductions or anything like that, uh, we always have to think, okay, what jobs do we want to eliminate? Because that's what we're really talking about. And then as you say, what do we spend our money on? We really spend the bulk of it on public safety, police and fire, emergency dispatch, things like that. Um, there's the public works and the general government are the other big pieces of that as well. General government looks big, and the reason for that is that um, we have a lot of our we don't um, most of our unions don't have not don't have settled contracts yet. And you'll see this later in the slides. So we don't put money in their budget to say, oh, we think you're going to get X percent. We put it into a pot because we want to account for it. But but we're in the middle of negotiations with five of our collective bargaining units, when those collective bargaining units are settled, we'll fund them out of this part of this blue, blue box, box there. Um, so what, what's included in the town budget? Um, we had, welcome to our new counselors, we have a budget for them, it's not enough, they don't get paid nearly enough, uh, they're my bosses, I'm, <laughs> I'm encouraged to say that, but they work, I mean, I think anybody who's paid attention to town government seriously recognizes the how hard uh, these people are working because they're building something from scratch and um, every decision has to be thought about and said is this the best way we can do it can we learn from others so I really give them credit for the amount of work that they're putting into it this uh, this the charter called for a, a small salary that to be paid but to the counselors uh, plus we have some expense money for them to attend 
there's a conference in Boston every year that the Mass Municipal Association puts on, and that takes some money to go to that and subscribe to certain things. Um, we eliminated some funds because we, didn't, we don't have to pay the select board anymore, and they receive a small stipend as well, and the town meeting had a small budget. Uh, as I mentioned that top right one, the salary was reserved for contract negotiations, that's there. I want to make sure everybody knows that you'll see um, increases in public safety being really low, and you'll say, why are they so low? It's because there are no salary increases budgeted for those accounts. And then because we got rid of the health insurance trust, which was a standalone entity, there were people who worked for the trust that were paid out of the trust. Now those positions have moved over into the town's um, budget, and so we've absorbed those within the 2.6% that was included. So I'm going to talk about individual groups of departments. So the first one is public safety. It shows a 1% increase, and again, no, it doesn't include any of the um, collective bargaining increases that are, that are for their uh, employees. Um, I already mentioned the loss of the EMS service to, to the town of Hadley. <coughs> An important note on that is that we didn't reduce the staffing of the fire department because of that. Hadley um, accounted for 20% of our, our ambulance calls. Um, we have about 5,000 ambulance calls a year. About 1,000 of them went to Hadley. Um, so there was already, we had done a fire staffing study and there was already stress on the fire department. So this just relieves, relieved that stress a little bit. Um, the other thing that I mentioned a little bit about us being a regional um, public uh, uh, emergency services agency. So we provide dispatch services to Leverett, Pelham, and Shrewsbury. Uh, we provide ambulance services to those other communities. They, we have contracts with them. They, they provide us a, a stipend and then we collect you know, the services. And I think the attitude of the town has been, like regional schools, that Amherst has a duty to help the other communities who have less of a tax base and things like that. And it, when I interviewed here, I was sort of shocked by how willing the town has been to help make sure that those proper services were delivered to the other communities. And they're grateful for that too. Public Works, 1.7% increase, again, does not include the contractual salary increases. Um, and you know, I'm trying to figure out, they're basically just gonna keep doing what they're doing. One of their big things this year has been that they went over their snow department, their snow removal budget this year by $130,000, $114,000. And um, so we're gonna figure out how to make that whole for them for this fiscal year. Um, but basically there's no new services being offered for, for DPW. There are some things we're trying to do better all of, in all of our departments, but for the DPW it's really about getting a better works, work order system and implemented so that they can uh, receive recommend, or ideas or um, complaints from the people in the town and they, they can follow them pro properly to the right people to get them fixed. Um, conservation and development is a 4.7% increase that again does not include contractual salary increases. Um, so things that they're working on this year, you'll see a new dog park coming up. That's gonna be funded through grants through the Stanford Foundation, uh, starting to prepare for Puffer, Puffer's Pond improvements. Up there you'll see new um, roadway signage. The Mill Street Bridge has opened. Um, it's a one-way bridge and there's gonna be um, paving, pavement markings to try and rationalize the parking uh, around the Puffer's Pond area, especially especially on State Street. Uh, we'll have extra police officers there, especially early in the season, to monitor things. Um, it, if you go there in the heat of the summer, it's crazy, and uh, we, you just, I worried constantly about making sure emergency personnel could get there if there was an emergency, and cars were parked on both sides of the street. It's just like, we have to fix this. We're doing it in a really sensitive way. We're not putting up lots of signs. We're, it's all reversible. Um, we're putting paint, paint on, the, on the ground and trying to do it so that if, if people go, wow, you really screwed up, we can reverse it quickly. Um, and also one of the beauties of the Puffer's Pond, especially State Street, is that it feels like a country road and we want to maintain that feel. So that's one of the big things. Um, on the agenda also is to talk about the North Common and the Main Street parking lot. Uh, the, the council has asked us to put that off till later in the year. It's just, it's a big project. It, revolves around parking downtown, which is a very complicated issue. So once the council is ready to take that on, we'll be coming back to the council to start engaging with that conversation. The um, council has expressed a lot of interest in reviewing the master plan for the town, which is a really important document. 
and that project will be going on. And then there's a, a, a heavy emphasis on planning in North Amherst, specifically around the intersections um, and, uh, in front of the library, adjacent to the library, and that whole area in terms of how, where that's going in the future. And one other feature is that they we're updating our flood maps, uh, and that's a that's a it sounds like a simple thing, but it's a pretty intense thing. It takes a lot of effort from our GIS people. Um, community services is going down by 3.3 percent again, does not includes uh, our contractual salary increases, uh, increased hours for public health nurse. Um, we reorganized LSSC, which is our recreation department, and had some savings from a reduction in positions there. Uh, LSSC has been doing really good work. They have reached out into the community. They're programming things at Butternut Farms and other and on East Hadley Road to try and bring their services to where people are living, especially during the summer. <coughs> and they've actually been recognized for that statewide uh, at one of their conferences this year, so credit to them for that. The big thing, the big emphasis for us this year, like last year, is on roads and sidewalks. Last year we put in a million dollars in, um, in town funds and roads. We had been putting in $200,000 a year. We quadrupled, we, we, whatever that quantum is, five times that as much this year. Um, and in addition to that, we have about $840,000 that we get from state aid. It's still not enough. We did a study of all the, all the roads, or the company came in and surveyed every road in the town. We need over $2 million for the next six years to meet, to bring our roads up to the standards that they need. So this is not just a one-year commitment. We're trying to carve out funds to really invest in the roads and sidewalks that are really needed. Um, sidewalks, previously we, we were putting in $30,000 a year to improve sidewalks. Sidewalks are really important for everybody, be it little kids, for walkability, for health. Um, I met with a group of sixth graders today who um, talked about their they can't ride their bikes to school at Fort River because the sidewalks aren't, their parents won't let them be on the roads because the roads are too dangerous and the sidewalks aren't in good enough shape to ride. And they were frustrated because they wanted to ride their bikes to school. And so it's that type of thing that we have to really start investing in and we're prepared to do that. Um, and then we're also, our first order of business when we talk about if we have capital money, what do we do with it? We want to take care of the buildings that we have, this building included, town hall, police station, uh, things like that. We have over a million dollars that we're investing in exterior maintenance and building repairs. Our first thing is to make sure the roofs don't leak. I'm not going to talk about the school buildings right now. Um, and then, because that's the first order of business in all of our buildings, we have some work to do on the um, town hall roof and on the police station roof. Um, Energy conservation, uh, always looking at programs that can help us make us run our buildings more efficiently. And making uh, security improvements is a really important thing for us too because um, in the world where we live in, we're always looking at how we can upgrade our security systems and procedures. Um, we're also beginning the process of planning for the big, the, the big new buildings that we know are coming down and are, what are very much needed. We have $900,000 programmed in this capital budget to begin the studies for the, and the schematic design, things like that, for these buildings. That includes the Department of Public Works headquarters, the fire department headquarters, and a new elementary school. We want to get those projects moving. Uh, again, this is another major topic for the um, town council. They're, they're going to be grappling with the challenge of Yes, we all recognize we have these needs and the library is out there too. People talk about a new senior center, they talk about a parking garage, but how can we afford it? How can we pay for it all without running everybody out of town because their taxes go too high? And so that's the, the thing that they'll be working with all summer and into the fall. Um, so what can you exact, expect coming forward? Um, we're going to be looking at renovations to the North Common if the council agrees with the plan or a plan to go forward with that. Um, we have a parking study going on downtown, on um, downtown parking right now that should be finished in June. Um, that will be delivered to the council and then probably, maybe the council will work out the summer, we haven't really talked about it, but realistically it probably won't come back until the fall when people are back in town and can have a rational conversation about what are the solutions to parking downtown. Um, we're working right now on Groff Park with a complete renewal of that with funds from some CPA funds and other funds. 
I mentioned the dog park already. Uh, we're working on putting solar, we've been working for a long time on putting solar on the north landfill. Uh, that is in the permitting stage and it will take about a year to permit. We're estimating that in 2020, we're hoping to get into the construction phase of that. What else is on there? We've been reading the paper about athletic fields and the condition of our athletic fields. Uh, we've had a study of our athletic fields. We know that there's incredible need for that. It's in that three to five to six million dollar range. It's another big number, and we have, we're sort of figuring out how does that fit in with all of our other capital needs. Um, some of the fields are on regional school property. They have put it in there as one of their top priorities uh, in the coming years, but it's something that we have to take into account. Uh, Huffer's Pond is, um, if you've been up there lately, it's starting, it really is filling up, literally with, with sediment. It, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, an art, it's, it's made by people. It's not a natural pond, so it needs to be dredged, and that happens every once in a while. We're gonna be going, getting ready for the permitting of that and then presenting the idea of, of dredging that coming in the future. We talked about the North Ambridge Village Center. Our water system is really important in making sure that we have adequate supply and uh, diversity of supply too, and that there's resiliency, something that we'll be investing in in the coming, um, coming year. And then our buildings, again, the library, DPW Fire School, uh, those are the things that we really want to get a plan how are we going to move forward? If we're not going to move forward, let's say it and let everybody know about it. Um, so this is to show you where we are today. Um, we've been working, we, in the fall, we forecast our revenue streams. We allocate where that money will go um, through the um, guidance from the, at that point, the, the finance committee and the select board. Um, we, internally, the staff starts to meet and refine. We finalize it, we present our budget to the uh, finance committee, which again has been meeting twice a week during this month. And then the next step is for the um, council to adopt the budget, and then during the course of the year they monitor the budget. So this is just where we are. So today we are on May 21st, and that's where the finance committee holds its public hearing. That's a, something that's required by the town charter. Um, next up is uh, May 28th, the finance committee is is scheduled to vote on the, its recommendation. The Finance Committee makes a recommendation to the full Town Council. And then um, on June 3rd, they, they present that recommendation to the Council. And then on June 6th, yeah. no, yeah. June, I'm sorry, it's, it should be it's June 10th. It's June 10th. Yeah, that's, that's <coughs> uh, June 10th is a public forum on the capital plan, so we talk about the capital items there. And then the, the, the Council has to vote on the budget by June 30th. And that's the presentation I have for tonight. And uh, get ready for questions to the chair. Um, so as, as I said before, I'm going to start with two pieces um, to see if there are any questions from the council right now that can ask questions later too. But if there are any clarifications that anybody thought was helpful, and if not, then I want to turn to questions from Mr. Bachman about his presentation to members of the public. So, yeah, Dorothy. Um, when you said the North Amherst Village Center, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about the intersection and the North Amherst Library. Um, it was I wasn't quite sure all that was encompassed in that phrase. Um, it, it certainly is the intersection. It's the intersection um, that um, the two intersections and how they interrelate. So we've done the traffic study, and that's up on the website. That just monitors the traffic flow. It doesn't take into account any of the finances, any property takings that might have to happen, what's, what's the cost of the options, <coughs> nor does it take into account what do we want that area to look like do we, in terms of planning. So I think that there's an effort there. Is, um, the, the planning department wants to put a, an effort into planning that whole area, we'll pay more attention to it, especially with the impact of um, the new development there. So hearing nothing, I'm going to go. Somebody back here is ask has a question. So, um, the item that you had on your penultimate slide, you said May 28th. I think I had understood that meeting was May 23rd. Could you clarify? The. Uh, the Could you show us the yeah. penultimate slide? Yes, go back to it, but uh, there's several different meetings that we have indicated. The Finance Committee has been meeting twice a week 
generally on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and uh, we have, in each of those meetings, been looking at sections of the budget. So the May 23rd meeting is actually a finance committee meeting, uh, one of a whole group of finance committee meetings that has been taking place during the month. Each time we are <coughs> uh, looking at one section on that particular day, we are, working, we are going to be looking as a finance committee at the capital plan and the Community Preservation Act committee proposals. So that's what's happening on May 23rd. The May 28th date uh, is the date on which uh, the Finance Committee is going to vote on budget recommendations, not necessarily CPAC, the Community Preservation Act uh, recommendations, but on the, the budget that was presented um, and heard today. And uh, I know that there's a lot of interest in the Community Preservation Act this year, um, so I will come back to it and explain a little bit more about that process um, in a couple of minutes, but I want to see if there are <coughs> questions. Okay, um, I have a request actually from uh, a note taker. Uh, if people could let us know their name and address, that would be helpful. So, yeah. Would you like, my name is Rosie Cowell. My address is um, 104 Dana Street. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not. And more recording. Part is recording. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, there was a picture. Sure. <clears throat> my name is David Robertson, and my address is 39 Northampton Road. Uh, and my, my question is I enjoyed the budget presentation. Um, one thing I didn't see, and this, you might have to excuse my ignorance, I think my question is do um, Amherst College and the University of Massachusetts, which I think are tax-free organizations, are there ways that they fiscally support the town? Not enough. <laughs> um, and we're um, in negotiation, we're discussing, in discussions with the university, especially right now, that's the big one, and one of our missions is to document what they already contribute, what we contribute to them, and to make them more financially accountable for what they are, we believe they, are, they should be paying to support the town operations. And the same with Amherst College and Hampshire College. Hampshire College doesn't pay anything. Amherst College pays us a small amount. So do you want community support for that? Yes. Yes. Happy to support that? Yes. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I had one, and it's just because. Um, again, if you could give. Oh, I'm sorry. Barbara Grab Wilbur, 126 Northampton Road. Um, my question, and probably a dumb one, is you talked about the increases in fees, revenue 2.6 for water and sewer, plus then the increase in tax rate. So is that 7.7% increase for each? I mean, is that the impact that's going to have on my um, income that I can anticipate paying an additional 7.7% in the year 2020? No, the, the way what the state, what the law, what Prop 2.5 says is that we can't raise for the entire town more than 2.5%. So some properties will go up more, the values will go up more, and some won't go up as much. But the average for the entire town has to be 2.5%. So it's not everybody goes up 2.5% or 4%, whatever it is. So it depends on the value of your property and how it's evaluated compared to all the other property in town. And the other piece to that, um, uh, I'll add to it is that uh, there was reference in the presentation to water and sewer rates and uh, the council has to approve after um, it's pres presented to us what um, the water and sewer rates for the next year will be. Uh, there is going to be that proposal to increase the water and sewer rates by a little over 2%. Uh, and the council will uh, consider that recommendation. Um, I guess there are a couple things to explain it all. One is, is that the water and sewer funds are actually separate from the rest of the town budget. So you have the tax supported part of the budget and then you have the, uh, what are called the water um, uh, and sewer enterprise funds, which are separate where the 
cost of running a water system, use that as the example, comes entirely from uh, the amount that we uh, can charge for water usage. That's actually common in cities and towns across the Commonwealth. Um, should be noted that uh, our rates are really very low in comparison to our neighboring communities. Um, and uh, we, have much, uh, we always get compared to Northampton, and we always like to remind folks that uh, we do have substantially lower water and uh, disposal rates than does our city to the uh, other side of the river on the west. Okay, I also want to say is you can't take the, each of those percentages and add them up. So think of what your water bill is. So if your water bill was $100, it's 2% over that amount of money. Right, I understand. Yeah, that. you know, so it's, it's, it's going to be differential whether it's real estate tax or not in terms of the impact on you. Yeah. So another question? Yes. Hallie Hughes, 30 Orchard Street. So the transportation fund is going down 9.5%. Is that what we contribute to the bus or? Yes. And so, and then in, in, when you have new, so do you work with Pioneer Valley Transit or in creating bus routes in town or do they respond to the town's need individually or how would that be impacted? So, um, the, the town does have a seat on the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority Board. We do have conversations with them about the services. The service the lines are pretty much set. They were, the last time I think the line was adjusted was when it went farther up into North Amherst when the Survival Center opened up. Um, this year, uh, town meeting appropriated $53,000 uh, in additional money to have evening services. I did not include that this year. So that's why that budget went down. That was the main reason. Yeah, I wanted to add on the enterprise funds, which the transportation fund is one of, the capital plays a big part in that percentage going way up or way down. So if we need more capital and one of them, the budget's going to go up because the capital is within that operating budget. It's not separate like the general fund is. So this year we need less <coughs> capital and um, transportation, so that was part of that decrease. And I, I guess the last thing I'll just say to that, and then I'll to the next question, but uh, uh, the transportation fund, um, it's other major um, expenditure, but also uh, revenues, um, its revenue source largely is the parking system. Um, yes? Well, that was going to be my comment was, if you decrease the transportation, the buses and stuff, will that not impact the amount of parking you're going to need? Because if people can't use a bus to get here, will they then have to drive their cars? So I'm... Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, what, we're, what, we, um, what we bought this year were late night service during the summer. So it's it additional runs at like 9.50 at night. So that wouldn't really impact. The, the, the existing runs aren't being adjusted. The BBTA looks at all their, their routes based on ridership. They count every person who gets on and gets off the bus. So they know what their ridership numbers are. And they adjust that according to the, their budget. But frankly, their budget is under stress too because they rely on state funds a lot and assessments from towns and cities. And they're not getting the value, the amount of money that they feel they're entitled to in a sense because they feel that a lot of money is going to the MBTA in Boston, which has an incredible need and sort of is this black hole that absorbs a lot of funds. And the regional transit agencies are saying, don't forget about us. We're the third largest regional transit agency in the Commonwealth and it has a wide swath of service area. Um, so it's a, it's a challenge for them as well. Yes. Um, my name's Kate Trost, 99 Dana Street. I didn't come to talk about transportation, but I just took the train to New York from Northampton, and I want to encourage that there be a linkage from Amherst to the train system. Because this is pretty exciting to be able to take public transportation down to New York, including to where I was going when I was in New York. So the only place that I really had um, the difficulty was Amherst to Northampton. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I understand there's going to be um, additional trains in the, within the next six months. So there'll be, rather than just one, uh, there'll be three lines, three times going down to New York. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. So I don't yes. know who's, 
where that fits. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually helpful. We, as uh, Mr. Bachman indicated, we do have a representative who sits on the uh, PBTA board, and uh, that's a valuable comment to convey to him as our representative. Um, so this is another question I think I saw. Yeah, the uh, Tim Average, uh, 143 Northampton Road. Uh, the town council's deadline uh, to vote on the budget is June the 30th. Is that actually when it's going to happen, or do you know when it's going to happen? Right now, the meeting, there's two meetings scheduled in June. They are scheduled for June 6th and June 20th. We would hope to complete voting by June 20th. Okay. Uh, there's one other thing I was going to say about the transportation fund and just generally. Um, if you're interested in looking at the town manager's budget as a whole, um, it's a several hundred page document sure. and it contains a lot of information. And it's really, uh, if you're interested in what's going on in the town, it's a valuable resource to have. Um, it is available online as our prior years by going to the town website, which is still back to the uh, amherstma.gov. And then if you go under government, which is one of the tabs across the top, um, one of the next tabs you get to from that is budget. And you'll be able to very easily find town manager's budget and uh, there's great detail in each section. So for example, on uh, I'll just pull the police department. Uh, the, it gives the mission of the police department, it gives the goals of the police department, um, the achievements that they've had in achieving last year's goals, what they predict their big challenges are, and then how what their budget um, submission is, and how it relates back to um, staffing and to the um, items that I just mentioned. Um, also in there are some appendices in Appendix F is um, transportation fund data and it actually gives the um, ridership for um, a lot of the bus lines for each of the fiscal years so that you can, uh, as I say, it's a treasure trove of information for anything that you, <coughs> you might find you're interested in so I wanted to make you aware of it. You yeah. can also find the school budget there, as well as the library budget, and just as with the town budget, um, they have a lot of meaty data about their accomplishments and the kinds of services they provide. A lot of people put a lot of work in putting their budgets together as a communication document, not just about dollars, but about accomplishments and services. Okay. Yes. Um, my name is Rosie Carroll, 104 Dana. Um, President Greisner, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, um, you just mentioned that um, you hope the town council will have completed voting on the budget by June 20th. That it may sound as though you're kind of doing the votes kind of piecemeal, maybe over the 6th and the 20th, or maybe other dates as well. Could you unpack for us how, how that works, how you do the votes? Since we are making this up as we fly the plane, Mm -hmm. uh, you've heard that line on more than one occasion. This is the first time this town council has gone through a budget cycle. Uh, it will in part depend on how the finance committee uh, forwards their recommendations, whether they forward it as pieces or and or as a whole. Yeah. And then we will take those up, making sure that the council has plenty of time to talk about each of the pieces prior to that. But in addition to that, for all of the um, Finance Committee meetings. They are all taped by Amherst Media and put up by Amherst Media. And they've all been made committee of the holds so that anybody from the town council could come and fully participate in the meetings uh, as well. And I mentioned those two dates because those are the dates that are presently on our calendar. Clearly, if we've not reached uh, consensus on the budget, by the 20th, we would have to call another meeting of the council. Okay. Um, I guess one other thing, and then I'm going to, I, I see, I did see you and saw 
federal list uh, brewer from the select board just a second. Um, <laughs> um, the, the one thing I wanted to just add to that is that um, I know that a lot of people here, not everybody, but a lot of people came because you're also concerned about Community Preservation Act proposals. And um, the um, Community Preservation Act should be um, also voted by the council during the month of June, but it does not need to be in the same vote. And uh, in fact, um, it is unlikely that it will be, but will be pretty close in date. They are sort of parallel um, and linked processes, but they are separate processes. I just didn't want to uh, leave that out and create confusion when you hear the budgets coming up and then find out that an item you're, you're concerned about isn't coming up on the same day. Lynn and then yeah, Melissa. And I'm going to ask Sonia to correct me on this, but when it comes to the Community Preservation Act, we can vote for all, we can vote against all, and then we can also separate them and vote them individually. And um, I just, uh, to supplement, um, is, uh, Community Preservation, Act, a Community Preservation Act Committee uh, reviews proposals and then uh, makes decisions on what they would recommend to the council as they formally did to town meeting. Um, and as in the former process, and it's the same for the current process, um, the council um, cannot fund anything that wasn't requested, but we don't um, half the fund what they proposed. So um, our um, votes are on what they proposed to us, but it is um, within the context that I just described. Alyssa, I'm sorry. No problem. It's just a simple request, actually, in comparison to lots of these things. So if we could republish this timeline with the third and the 17th listed, since those are actual scheduled council mm -hmm. meetings, that would help my brain. Because I keep hearing the 20th mention, and I don't know what the 20th represents. <coughs> so I think it's the third and the 17th. I'm just, okay. Thank you for that correction. It is the third and the 17th. Um, this month, we have it's the 6th and the 20th. 20th. <coughs> the the, the council meetings will be on June 3rd and June 17th unless we have to yeah, call a special town council meeting. No. Okay. So, um, but just see if there's any final questions, because what I had said at the beginning, and we'll come back to, is that um, I also, we were, um, wanted to have time for people to speak about budget, um, beyond questions, what your concerns are, which you particularly um, find um, something that you support and want more attention to, something that you uh, have uh, concerns about, however you want to phrase it. And, um, so I want to open up the floor to that. So just to make sure that there are no additional questions. Margaret, do you want people to write their names? No, actually. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so um, shall we turn to the next section then? It's your, your meeting, so if so, uh, I open the floor now to general comments in general, not, not just questions. So, anything that people want to say about any particular section of the budget? Back row, way back. William Kaysen, 32 Goldenrod Circle. Uh, I just want to thank the town manager for really listening to the public and, and keeping money and increasing the money for roads and sidewalks in the budget and thank the council for supporting that because I really do think it's an issue that affects us all very directly every day and um, so thank you. Are there things that you'd like to be conveying to us? It's the public here, we want to hear from you. Yes. Uh, thanks, Please. Kate Sim, uh, 77 Dana. And um, I would like to just uh, recap, I guess, a letter that I sent yesterday along with my spouse uh, regarding the proposed 132 Northampton Road SRO development project, um, which we now understand clearly. The vote is, we believe, scheduled by the Town Finance Committee for May 23rd. 
And it wasn't clear whether or not public comment would happen before or after that vote. So I think that's part of the reason why many people are here to try to speak yeah. tonight. We won't be voting. Um, but uh, just and then please continue after. Uh, uh, what is going to happen at that meeting is we will hear um, a presentation from the Community Preservation Act Committee and several of the presenters may also choose to be present. They don't have to be, but uh, <coughs> some of the applicants may be in attendance. Uh, it is an open meeting. Public comment is also offered as an opportunity at that meeting. Um, but uh, it is our opportunity uh, as a finance committee to hear for the first time from the Community Preservation Act Committee as to why they're making the recommendations they are and to any of the petitioners who choose to come forward. So we, I don't, do not expect that we will be voting that day. Uh, but please continue. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. I think still uh, a lot of people are working during the day, so it may also be a difficult time for many people to attend. Um, so I, uh, my two comments are just to urge you to vote to delay funding on that project until there's a chance for due diligence on the full long-term cost of the project for the town, since it is a finance committee, and meaningful input by neighborhoods uh, most affected by the development. So in terms of unbudgeted costs, the project does seem likely to entail substantial extra costs for the town, including needs for traffic management or lighting in the area or additional resources devoted to social support. Um, and so it seems to be the responsibility of the Finance Committee to make a full accounting of those costs before voting yes or no. Then second, uh, on the meaningful input, meaningful input is called for in the 2016 Town of Aramark's Housing Production Plan, but it doesn't seem to have yet happen. Uh, perhaps this is one of the venues where it can happen, but I'm not sure that uh, everybody has come prepared for meaningful input on short notice. Um, the, the project supporters cite that housing production plan and the plan states on page 73, it will be important to continue to be sensitive to community concerns and provide opportunities for residents to not only obtain accurate information on housing issues, whether they relate to zoning or new development, but have genuine opportunities for input. Uh, the plan further states on page 93 that efforts will, be need to, efforts will need to be made to provide information to the community, abutters in particular, on new developments to help bolster local support as discussed in strategy 5.1.1. Also, it will be important for local leaders, dot, 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 to help fine-tune development proposals to best meet local needs and address community concerns. Um, so, you know, uh, we wrote to ask town councilors to delay the project until these genuine opportunities for input have happened. Regardless of whether you support the development or not, we're asking for um, debate and discussion. It seems that Valley CBC has had several opportunities to present to the town, but uh, neighbors have, have not. Um, Neighbors didn't hear details of the project until the recent presentation on April 24th. Notices have been sent only to immediate abutters and not to the broader neighborhood. And the $500,000 in Community Preservation Act funding seems to have been recommended by CPAC before Valley CDC held their meeting with abutters. Um, so, you know, this is, as you mentioned, the town council is a new form of government for Amherst, and we're putting our trust in you to do this appropriate due diligence and listen to the community carefully before you make decisions. Uh, thank you for your time and service to the, to the town. Thank you. Um, I have a question on that, too. Have yeah, go it? ahead. Um, Brian Bird, it's just going. about the, the 500 that was in the, the budget that was presented at the meeting that you did. Um, it doesn't show up in the total of the budget, and the uh, explanation I got was because it hasn't been given yet. But if you're planning on spending it at some time, I just I was confused as to why it wasn't in the budget. Um, at this point, it's just a borrowing authorization. It's just saying the town is willing to borrow the money when they're ready to do it, and until we borrow the money and actually spend the money, you know, there's no um, cost. Debt service would come later on. And it would be part of. It. Right, but does that mean that you keep somewhere separately how, how much debt? I mean, is this the only debt that you have? Or there are other debts that are out there that's so in the back of yeah. the yeah. 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 debt is what's authorized and then issue. Yeah. But so and that total, does that total not enter into the the projected budget? Because it doesn't affect the budget until it becomes debt service, like a mortgage payment. 
Right, right. but you want to have that money, is that money sort of like in reserve then in case you need to come up with it? No, it's part of the budget process. It's part of the capital program that um, Paul was showing earlier. The five million debt service is taken out of there, so it would come out of there. Because it's a CPA, CPA funding would pay for that. So just if I can follow up on page 189 of the budget, you all have to find you. Um, you can see all the CPA debt. Um, if you want to go online, you find your name or slash budget. Um, that shows the debt for the work that has been over the, from now through FY25. And then this would be, if that was approved, this would be added, any other new debt would be added on next year. Thank you, Yes, yeah, so again, uh, as uh, we decided the budget, page 189, it's appendix D. It shows all of the debt for the town for various things, including, but not just exclusively, Community Preservation Act. And um, for those of us who've been around town for a long time, and we've seen, uh, some of us will remember back to uh, the fights over um, soccer fields with Plum Brook down uh, in South Amherst. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, quite a battle that uh, went all the way up to, I think, a voter initiative uh, yeah, that all of us had to go vote on it as to whether we supported that. But it's the kind of proposal where it is large enough that uh, even with Community Preservation Act funds, uh, something like that um, cannot be funded in a single year, otherwise there would be nothing else that could be funded. And so that, uh, at that point, uh, consideration is given to borrowing the money. It is then has to be paid back. So it does affect future years. I mean, it, um, it, we don't, uh, we recognize that and want you to know too, that if money is borrowed to build soccer fields or whatever, then for the number of years you're paying it back, you have less to allocate to something else because you've already committed the funds to um, paying back whatever is borrowed. So um, that is all part of the process that we need to go through um, as a, um, a finance committee and then as a council. Yes. Um, so my name is David Robertson. Um, I live at 39 Northampton Road. Um, I've written a couple kind of lengthy emails to the town council. Lynn just wanted to thank you for that. And that's um, my job. Very good. Uh, so I know they've been a, a received and acknowledged um, I, I, um, I'm not sure how much detail is appropriate to go into, but I, I have, um, so I'm, I'm a physician. Um, I work right now in allergy and clinical immunology. Um, I'm also board certified in adult internal medicine and general pediatrics. Um, I practice mostly at our Springfield office. We have offices around the area. Um, I'm also involved in, I have a master's in public health and I am involved in um, health policy at the state level through the Mass. Massachusetts Allergy and Asthma Society, where I'm the vice president. Um, so in general, um, I like and support the idea of affordable housing. I know that's this is a significant public health issue. Um, but one lesson that we keep learning over and over again in the field of medicine is that doing things with good intentions doesn't necessarily always have good outcomes. Um, in my particular little corner of the universe, uh, in the year 2000, there was a general recommendation uh, there's an acknowledgement that peanut allergy and nut allergy is a bad thing, um, and we should do something about it. And so there was a, a general recommendation to uh, avoid nuts, uh, avoid that stuff until age three. And what we saw was the rate of peanut allergy across the country skyrocketed. It turned out to be the exact wrong advice. Um, there was no evidence to support it, but there were some good ideas about it. Maybe the you know infant gut isn't fully mature, whatever. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. There was very little evidence to support it and it was exactly the wrong advice. Um, and so follow-up studies have actually shown that early peanut introduction is a good idea. Um, in terms of this specific um, property and um, <clears throat> the proposed development, I did attend the, um, uh, the, the meeting on April 24th, and I walked away with a, a number of different concerns. Um, I think they could be broadly categorized into two categories. One is transportation and access to community services. And then the other really falls under the category of social support for the residents. Um, so in their proposal, the Valley CDC has acknowledged that the majority of residents at this property are going to have limited access to transportation. 
Um, and because of that, they've actually asked for fewer parking spots than they have residents. There's supposed to be 28 residents, and I think there's maybe 12 to 14 parking spots. But the idea is that basically, these people are not necessarily going to have cars. Um, and so the nearest bus stop is 0 0.4 miles away up the hill in town. Uh, and as, as you mentioned, the last time the bus routes were adjusted were actually when the Amber Survival Center was placed. And it, in fact, the Amber Survival Center at that point was 0 0.4 miles from the nearest bus stop. So um, I'm concerned that um, this population, which is already an average population, um, 12 out of 28 are going to be either homeless people or people um, that are under the um, services of the Department of Mental Health um, and may or may not have disabilities that they're being asked to walk 0.4 miles into town to get to the nearest bus stop. Why was that too far for people that use the Amherst Survival Center, but it's acceptable for the residents of this property? Um, so I think that's a significant concern. Um, um, actually, possibly more significant concern is um, access to the shopping center down at the bottom of, at the, bottom of the hill at University Drive. Um, that's promoted as being 0 0.6 miles away, which is a little bit further. Um, the hill is kind of steep, um, but uh, the bigger issue is there's no sidewalk. So on the, um, on the south side of the street, the westbound sidewalk going down the hill actually ends basically in front of 132 Northampton Road, the proposed property. It really ends right at the beginning of the uh, Amherst, at, at Amherst College Athletic Field. So there's no safe way to actually get across the street to get down the hill. The nearest crosswalk is 0 0.3 miles up the hill at Pleasant Street, where they have to cross, go up the hill 0 0.3 miles, cross over the street, another 0 0.3 miles down, and then walk another 0 0.6 miles. So it's actually 1.2 miles to legally and safely cross Route 9 to get to the shopping center. Um, or residents are going to be faced with the option to cross illegally and unsafely, <coughs> um, which again just doesn't seem optimal. And to be 100% honest, I'm trying to imagine it myself. We went over our snow budget this year. It was a bad year for snow. Walking 1.2 miles in the snow to go to a grocery store and carry home groceries doesn't seem practical or feasible or even humane. Um, I, don't, I don't think that, I, I don't know how that works for these residents. Um, <coughs> So um, one possible solution that would kind of address this is if Valley CDC was willing to uh, offer a shuttle service. That would really ameliorate a lot of these things, but then that's a significant cost of like operating a shuttle van and having a driver and commercial insurance and all these things. And I don't, I don't think that's something that wasn't part of their presentation for sure. Um, now, one upcoming thing that will actually maybe alleviate that to some extent is the proposed expansion and improvement of Route 9. Um, so, yeah. so do everybody knows about, I think everybody knows about this, yeah, you guys do, but. Um, so, um, Route 9 is going to be expanded and there's going to be sidewalks on both sides of the street. There's actually gonna be a crosswalk at Orchard Street, which would be very convenient to this, but I believe that that project won't be done until sometime optimistically in 2023. Um, and so the question is, during the construction, we've already, I've already kind of highlighted why access to either the bus routes or the shopping area is limited. During construction, it's going to be even more disrupted because the sidewalks are gonna to be torn up. So how does Valley CDC um, plan to support residents' needs in terms of transportation during that period? And again, a shuttle bus or a shuttle service might do that, but I, I, don't, I don't, there's nothing that I know of in their proposal. <coughs> Um, that would really um, address that. So that's, that's kind of the transportation and access side of things. The other side of things are social services, right? So again, um, a significant portion, the, the, the National Institutes of Mental Health estimates that 46% of homeless people either struggle with what they classify as severe mental illness and or substance abuse issues. Um, and, and, and the Valley CBC, again, has acknowledged it in their proposal. Um, 90% of alcoholics in recovery relapse within the first four years of sobriety. Relapse is a natural part and it's an expected part of the recovery process. It just, it just happens and then you support um, the addict and, and, and work through it. It's part of the process. But my concern is, based on the numbers, again, 12 out of 28 are going to be people that are either actively homeless or under the care of the Department of Mental Health. 
Um, statistically speaking, there's going to be multiple residents who are struggling with addiction or mental health issues at that facility. So the question is, what on-site services, again, highlighting the difficulty of transportation and access to get to care, what services are going to be on-site for addicts when they relapse? What services are going to be on-site to support the other members of the community or the other members, uh, the other tenants or residents, um, again, when, when someone does relapse? And I, I, don't, I haven't seen anything in the Valley CDC's proposal that, that addresses that. And we brought this up at the meeting on April 24th. The response was they would have a day manager, but there would be no overnight. They're, they're, they actually have no plan for anybody with the professional credentials in mental health counseling or substance abuse counseling on site. Um, and so I think that to, to me it almost seems like you're running it like an apartment complex, which that's not what this is. Um, these are people, this is an at-risk population. The reason we're doing this and even talking about this is because we acknowledge this is an at-risk population. So I think to, to, to lump a bunch of people together who need social support and then not provide that social service is, is a disservice to them. Um, Homeless women, in particular, and I, I, I forgot to send the article, but I, I tried to make up where I, I did send it, um, are a, a specific population that are at risk and have um, different um, risk factors. There, there's um, a high percentage of homeless women um, are have been past victims of either domestic or sexual assault or abuse. Um, there's a high rate of PTSD and actually concomitant um, substance abuse. And so uh, Valley CDC, estimated that 70% of their tenants in this mixed gender um, single, room, room occupancy, single room occupancy structure historically have been male. So my question again is how are they going to support and protect um, women, homeless women or, or women of, of, um, who are struggling from a socioeconomic standpoint, what specific interventions and what specific support services are they going to have for women at this facility that's going to be predominantly male? If, if historical trends continue. Um, and then I think finally, um, this SRO would be the largest SRO that Valley CDC has ever tried to operate. And um, my, my concern and question again is what specific challenges have they foreseen with that and what have they done to accommodate them? And I don't, I don't, I don't know if they have any response to that. So thank you for everybody um, giving me a few minutes. I'm sorry if I took too much time. <coughs> Since there are issues that are beyond financial, I don't know if you have any thoughts about how you intend to, to leave the council to, to this uh, discussion. Oh, boy, this is good. That's so sweet. Actually, I do. Although I've not presented it to the council. At some point in the not too distant future, I do think we need to have a conversation a conversation that includes some representatives of the council, some representatives of the town government, some representatives of the community, and some representatives of the people in the community who advocate for this. And we need to come up with a resolution of how to move forward from where we are today, which is pretty much at a standoff. And um, the people in the council that I've got to know, and they've got to know me, know that my general approach to things is to basically look at all the issues and figure out how to find a path to move forward. And I don't know what that path is, but I do know that there are people who I think could help manage this conversation, both with the neighborhood as well as people who represent the housing advocates and community and people on the council who hold housing issues very near and dear to their hearts. And so before I think we as a council um, can go forward with this, I think we need to make that commitment to you as members. Thank you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed to clap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we yeah. passed that rule last night. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the one thing I, I'll add, and then I want to go back to you um, in the audience. Uh, the, the Finance Committee um, is the one who's convened tonight's hearing, and um, our role in the Community Preservation Act is to try and do financial analysis and offer advice on financial aspects of proposals back to the Council. Um, a number of issues were raised that were uh, 
beyond financial issues. And I recognize that, and that's why I wanted to do that. I did say at the beginning that um, I, I recognize that there would be an interest in talking about issues that were more broad, and um, I wanted to give the opportunity for that to happen, so I appreciate your okay. um, expression. Now I'll turn to more people. Um, Melissa's wait, trying to speak. Let's see. Um, Melissa, I understand. Yes. Um, one of the reasons that we have to have that conversation is because the town council knows almost nothing about its role in this particular project because the town council is so new that they've never done a comprehensive permit. It is completely different than when we had a select board. The town council is not a chief executive officer. The select board was. So this is different on so many levels from the Beacon project. That's one of them. Town manager is the chief executive officer, not the town council. We have, and I believe we will get a written document soon that explains what our limited role is. We appoint the ZBA, the ZBA actually issues the comprehensive permit. We can decide whether or not to fund the CPA request, and obviously that will make a really big difference to the project. We can attend the site plan, it's not a site plan review, but it, we can attend when the funding agency comes to do a visit, we're allowed to attend and put in input, just like the historical commission and all of you are allowed to put in input. But the only way we can stop this project is by not putting any money into it. And then if they find money elsewhere, we have nothing to say about that. So I think that that will really help as we eventually come to understand our role better and can put more things in writing. I know timelines and lots of other information have been provided. But I think once we know that better, we'll be able to better help you find the best ways to have the conversation with us and with each appropriate agency so you feel like you're really getting to the people who are making the decision points. Let me hear from more of the audience and come back to the council because that's what I said at the beginning would be the process. Uh, yes. Um, Kate Tros, 99 Dana Street. So one of the things that's happened is because we live close to this, many of us have gotten really into looking through the details. So we've become almost a resource. I and mean, we were working on this um, quite frequently. So we put together some more information. Including the ones that. Oh, can I give them to you when you pass away? Thank you. Yes. 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 I'll take them off. Take them off. Okay, great. And um, there are financial other financial issues in those in that um, information and I just want personally to say that I don't go at this as saying I'm not interested at all in the project but from the first time I heard about it there were safety concerns related to the amount of time that a on-site manager would be there the number of people that would be living there so that caused me to want to learn a lot more about it. And it's been frustrating with all of our efforts to do research, write letters, not having much response or knowing who's listening. And in fact, I've even talked to people who've been past the letters that we've written that aren't on your committee. And then most recently got an email from um, Amherst Forward or something advocating a position I mean, it was just very disconcerting because we're just been trying to do um, a detailed look at the concerns, the considerations of the specific project, and actually try to be constructive about it. And in our in our community, we have three physicians that have weighed in, um, a person that works in the social services um, field in a very similar project to this, and so we've been trying to contribute information, and we're eager to feel as though what we're doing is going to be listened to and taken into consideration and that maybe we can work something out that the neighborhood would feel comfortable, safe with, and it would be, would work. Yeah. So, oh, and I also want to say I tried to meet the Valley CDC. They canceled my meeting and they didn't reschedule. So let me continue on around. They'll just recognize yes. um, I appreciate getting another meeting together and it just occurred to me that I wonder if it makes any sense, if, and I probably couldn't bring them in, but people complained about the number of homeless or whatever. Has anybody talked to them to find out what they would want? Because it might be interesting to get perspective of the people who would potentially be in this environment, how they felt. 
or what they thought would be neat. So just maybe when you're drawing up your invite list or whatever. Thanks for that. Uh, or if you need names, uh, speak up so we you know. So far, so good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Let me just, I'm just, as I see hands, I totally react. It's like, go ahead. Uh, Hallie is 30 Orchard Street. I was actually on town meeting and voted for this, and I feel badly that it's being misconstrued that people are anti this. I know that I, for one, when I got the letter, was very happy to have. You know, a name. I, I thought it was going to be a, you know, condos or something. I didn't realize the size and scale of the development. I think there are a lot of people who are willing to work with LA CDC or other groups just to talk about the scale or the supervision. Nobody here, I think, is anti say don't develop this at all. But I would ask to delay the finance committee to delay approval of the CPA funds until there is more of a general consensus and that better understanding about the project because I've reached out to Valley CDC and haven't heard back and I have a lot of questions about when they say substance free for six months, what does that mean? What does that mean for alcohol? I'm on the Board of License Commissioner, so what does that mean for marijuana if it's legal? Is that substance free? I have heard back. Yes, in the back. Hi, Melissa Porter, um, 110 Dana Street and uh, I actually have been, I've done um, work in this field for 32 years now, and I currently run a program in the Holyoke, uh, Chicopee area, which oversees two separate SROs with 14 people um, served in each of them. And some are embedded in some of the housing authorities in, in many of the cities, municipalities around there. And, you know, we're predominantly funded by the Department of uh, Mental Health. And so the folks that I work with, and I serve 300 people, uh, it's a lot. Um, most of them have dual, addi dual addictions as well as homelessness, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, um, a number of things. And, you know, I think as many of the speakers have, have already stated very eloquently, um, and I don't want to sound redundant, but I think, you know, there is this kind of knee-jerk response of let's fix it, let's do something about, you know, homelessness. And I think it's very kind of, I think, it's ill-conceived in many ways, I guess, is, is the kind of way to say, to say this. And I think that there are many, many kind of problems that are, are you know, that I, I deal with daily. Um, I get phone calls from neighbors in the community at large on a daily basis about problems with these SROs. And I think it can be anything from public, nu public nuisance issues, you know, a variety of things, people that are having symptoms that need to go to the hospital, substance use, bringing people in off the street. And, you know, I think that I would just ask that we kind of look at um, Valley Development with kind of a discerning eye and, and to not be naive about they have an agenda. And, of course, they're, they're going to present things in a way that is they're doing a screening process that's very rigorous. Um, you know, that they're not going to allow leveled sex offenders in, uh, or people, I think the other stipulation was people that produce and distribute um, methamphetamines. So I don't really know what the other folk, what the other um, offenses can be that you can get in, but I can tell you right now, both the programs that I oversee are staffed 40 to 60 hours per week, uh, with staff there, five to six staff on site. And there are many, many problems. And so I think that actually they quoted us that the person that they would have would be some kind of like a property manager and would be there 20 hours per week. So I mean, I think that uh, it is a disservice to say the least for the folks that are in there and that are going to be living there. I think it's you know going to be a strain on a community in which we already have on on, on Route Nine. There's a lot of kind of absentee slumlords on that strip as a whole, and we have a lot of student housing there. And I think you know, when I guess I would want to say when we talk about affordable housing, I kind of wonder what that means as my property taxes go up incrementally every year. And I think, you know, affordable housing, and, and I think Amherst has had a reputation for many, many years of needing to attract kind of a different cross-section of people that don't make, you know, either under $7,000 uh, annually or over two hundred. And I think we don't have kind of a middle cross-section of people that we attract from neighboring towns and people that work where their median income is 50000 60000 I mean, like I said, I think 
there's this kind of uh, polarization of people that are attracted, and it's either people that are on mass health and are virtually indigent, or people that are making two hundred thousand dollars a year. And I think, you know, um, as as a person that kind of has you know uh, one income, um, you know, I live paycheck to paycheck. So when we talk, and again, my property taxes, they're high in Amherst. I mean, it's a, we have a reputation for extremely high property taxes. And, you know, so I think, I, I guess I question a lot of this in, in, in the sense of how is this conceived? What does affordable housing mean? Who are we trying to attract? I mean, all of it. And, and I think that, um, you know, sorry, that guy got a very, um, you know, impassioned. But anyway, I'll shut up now, so thanks. <laughs> um. I wanted to reserve some time to see if any of my fellow counselors um, either have questions that they want to ask about what they have heard or um, have anything else that they would like to say, and I did promise uh, Ms. Pan. Yeah. I, I have a question, um, and this is a finance thing. I have not totally followed how that $500,000 works. Um, for example, does it get paid back through um, uh, CPAC money that comes year by year by year? Uh, are there any town tax levies in there? Uh, does it affect, how does it affect the town's um, uh, capital projects going forward? And I'm asking you, Andy, as the expert, to explain that. Um. <laughs> oh, okay. Here's the expert. Here's the expert. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. 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 So um, this particular article is for borrowing authorization. Um, CPAC gets about a million dollars a year in surcharge revenues, which is part of your tax bill. Yeah. So we <laughs> use that money for affordable housing, historic preservation, open space, and recreation. And um, they. We had a lot of projects this year that came up on the table, and they funded quite a few of them. They didn't have enough for cash capital out of there to fund them all. So this one they, they chose to borrow for. So until the money's borrowed, and we've actually spent it, it doesn't really need to get paid back. Once it's spent and borrowed and we're paying um, debt service, it comes from that surcharge. It's, so that will be 1.1 million dollars less that debt service to go for the next right. year. Does that help? The other piece, though, is while it gets paid back from CPAC money, it does go against the total towns borrowing on it. Correct? It does. Um, though I'm, that's less of a concern than we right. thought it might be earlier. Um, what it does it. What is distinct is that um, the other projects that were being that were discussed by Mr. Botham, and, and you've probably read a lot about the need to replace the uh, two elementary schools that are quite sick, the um, library improvements at the library uh, itself, and the trustees um, are advocating for the fire department um, and um, building and the DPW building. Those would be town buildings to the extent that we end up borrowing money for them. They're going to be repaid from taxation uh, as that is a distinct part of the general budget. And uh, it can come up in one of two ways because either uh, there'll be uh, enough resources to um, do the repayment within current taxation levels, or the council could ask all of our voters, all of you and all the other voters, to approve what's called a debt exclusion override, but that's essentially um, an override that is only for the specific purpose of funding a particular project. Uh, so that's a whole different process than the Community Preservation Act borrowing which is what in um, the payback is from the money that is specifically allocated that portion of taxes which we voted um, is an additional increment for community preservation act so they're like two entirely separate pieces and they don't necessarily affect each other but um, it does have real 
consequences, as I said earlier, uh, to the extent that you decide to borrow money for a for this purpose or any other purpose, then in future years there's less CPA money for other housing historic preservation and uh, open space uh, pur purchases. Uh, so here one comment, and then I'm going to back, turn back to the council. Uh, there's a question. Um, my name is Amy Gilbert-Lawner. I'm at 14 Orchard Street. I just had a question about the timing. So they're coming to the town asking for, um, Valley CDC is borrowing, I'm sorry, the town is borrowing. The proposal is for the town to borrow $500,000 from CPAC and then debt service it back. Um, I just, but we were told it was a $5 million process. Why do they have to come to the town and have the town borrow the money first instead of going to other sources? How do you know with four hundred and fifty thousand dollars left to finance? I don't know that much about the financing, but to go from five hundred thousand to five million, mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. So um, we won't borrow the money until they need to spend it. What they're looking for from the town is a commitment of funds because when they go to the state for additional funds, they want to say the state says, "Does the town support this?" <coughs> Show me the evidence. Evidence is putting money on the table in essence, which is what this money would show. So that's why they're asking for it up front. There are two processes here. One is the finance process and one is the permitting process. Um, they haven't started the permitting process. That goes through the Zoning Board of Appeals. And it's kind of a chicken and egg. They can't really go to the state and say, can we move forward on our permitting unless the state looks at their pro forma and says, you've got, you've got your ducks in a row in terms of finances. Yes, you can go forward on permitting. So they're in the stage of trying to, to establish funds, funding sources. One of the funding sources is CPA. What the town would say, if, they, if the town council approves this, they, the town council would say, we're willing to borrow this money. We won't borrow it until you're absolutely ready to build, but we, we've promised that we will borrow the money when it, the time comes. And when it comes time to pay back that money, it'll come out of the CPA funds. So that's, that's the, the source is paying back the funds. That so then, um, just to follow up on that, we're talking, this is the finance committee, and we're talking about finances, but then I don't see how you can separate out some of the other social concerns that we have because the town is in the end saying they support it or don't support it so I just want to say that you know this is all kind of interrelated part of the whole discussion yeah, I, I think we, we we agree with what you just said that they are separate but very interrelated issues and uh, so that the finance committee will look at an aspect of it, but um, their, um, what the council president is, I think it's right, is, uh, is uh, indicated and is trying to explain is there is uh, going to be separate processes to look at a whole bundle of issues. And that's what she was explaining. And we do have a committee of the council that very early on, I think it was their second meeting looking at this, and it, they weren't ready to take this on, and so I don't want to um, point a finger on that either, uh, at all, even remotely. Uh, I, I do think that um, it has to be looked at both financially and socially. There's one other thing I want to confirm with Sonia and then turn back to, because I do see other hands. Um, to my recollection of how this all fits together, that this would require a two-thirds vote on the council because it involves borrowing. Those of you who were involved in town meeting, and I recognize several cases as having been former town meeting members, um, when we did CPA votes at town meeting, um, the moderator would distinguish which ones required a majority and which ones required two-thirds. And once the borrow the required borrowing required two thirds, so there will have to be a separate vote from the council that um, has the two thirds uh, threshold. Yes, please. Um, Don Casales, 67 Dean Street. I just have a question: If uh, there was a vote to delay borrowing money for the project, then what would the next uh, step be? Such a goal? Where to have? That, um, 
I want to make sure I'm correct on something, Paul. <coughs> they could go on without any money from us at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir. Whether that would sell with the state's another issue. They would make. I think they would make a judgment whether they, they needed this money or not. The council isn't. They can vote this whenever they choose. They're not tied to any fiscal year. They can vote the CPA funds as long as they're available. Mm -hmm. But they need, need nine votes of the council to, to borrow to authorize the town to borrow. Nine or eight. Eight is two thirds. How many on the council? Thirteen. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, but they, except for zoning issues, they could, you know, you could go out, you could buy a property, and you could say, this is what I'm going to do with it, if the property was zoned properly, and for that use, and you had the money. So that's called private enterprise. So the only way to really bring them to the negotiating table is to delay approval, perhaps, maybe. maybe. There is I mean, another. Because yeah. if, if town council wants to say, if it's, that's what I'm hearing. I have the impression that you're saying town council, there's really nothing that the town can do if they wanted to go ahead and do it. Zoning is the Ms. Brewer mentioned that. That's why she was mentioning right. the Zoning Board of Appeals, because there that's would be, that's where, um, and Melissa and I were on the select board most recently, uh, went through similar questions um, about the North Square development in North Amherst, and the select board was really involved in, again, the financing questions, but ultimately, the uh, final approval and the questions of what exactly would be built was um, a ZBA decision, and uh, it, 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 it you know it put our roles in the right place. And that's the analogy I would give. Yes, sir. just a quick question to so understand the timeline. Like I think you said, the um, CPA vote is not to, the vote for the finances of the CPA is not tied to the town count the town budget. So that June thirtieth deadline doesn't really apply. That vote, right? So um, Sonia, 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 Sonia had his stance on that asked, question. I asked this question because this is a borrowing yeah. article. Um, there's no, the deadline is now June thirtieth. Right. The rest of the CPA articles, because it's coming from estimated receipts, like the regular operating budget, then it does have to be voted before the tax rate is set. So June thirtieth to have it available for July one, it can have to be by June. Because this is borrowing. Okay. Yes, sir. Jimmy Schlesinger, 93 Dana Street. Um, at the April 24th meeting, I asked the Valley CBC representatives if they had enough clients in Amherst to fill 132 as proposed. And they said, definitely not. They thought they had, I think, about 60%, maybe 70 And they said that they would be advertising to get more people from a much larger area. And I'm just wondering if, you know, how it is that Amherst wants to spend money on service-needy folks from a very broad area that aren't being, you know, our town residents. If you know that they will come. They come no, up. more people will come. That's true. So, um, looking back to the council to see if there are any other um, further questions that you have, follow-ups, or comments, and then... Oh, I see that. One... Sorry. Yes, not one... See if we can conclude that. Okay. I hope it's quick. Rosie Carroll, 104 Dana. Could you explain to us, because I understand the members, most of the members of the ZBA are turning over this summer. Could you tell me, tell us first, how many of the, what, uh, how large a majority vote of the ZBA is required to grant a special permit? If there are five members, how many of those need to approve it? And also a little bit about the process for selecting the new members. Actually, can I turn you on that? 
boy, this is a thumb wrestle kind of deal. Um, so we just appointed the members of the CBA last night. That's done. Um, and they are almost all the same as they were before. There very, there's very little change. It's my understanding that as a comprehensive permit, unlike most votes of the CBA, which now that it's a five-member body, it used to be a three-member body, had to be unanimous votes for most things. For most things, it has to be a four out of five vote. For a comprehensive permit, it's my understanding, it has to be three out of five. Yes. Thank you, Kate Sims, 77 Dana Street. I just wanted to follow up on uh, Lynn's comment that there might be um, more room for conversation moving forward and wondering if you can clarify at all about if that were to happen, what kind of timeline or, or organizational no. process. To be honest, uh, I meet with the town manager every Wednesday, and this is on the top of my list for tomorrow, so he can get ready. <laughs> um, anything? Additional, if not, uh, Stockham, do you have anything in your insights or inclusion? Um, I really appreciate all that you've offered to us and the way of input that you know the purpose of a public hearing is that we can hear from you. And um, so we really appreciate you coming to, uh, to be a part of that process. So thank you. And uh, the uh, Hopefully now that you have a better understanding of the budget process and going forward, um, and since a lot of questions were about CPA, um, you know the, uh, what the date is, uh, two days from today, it is a daytime meeting as noted. Um, we will be getting the formal presentation for the first time at the Finance Committee of the CPA proposals. So far we have only received them in, in the written form which you may have seen because it's on the website. Um, and uh, we will diligently move forward and the information that you provided um, is very, very valuable and important part of the process. So thank you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your work. Um, in Amherst, sometimes it can feel, um, you can feel pressure to be silent around flashpoint topics like homelessness and affordable housing. And I think it's a mistake to give in to that pressure. I think uh, being, being vocal is part of being an engaged citizen. And so I hope these conversations can continue, continue forward. Who isn't in support of affordable housing, but that umbrella of affordable housing is rather wide. And um, there's a, a whole continuum of services that are required under that umbrella and I think we should be fiscally conservative and um, also careful about the language we use when we talk about our most vulnerable populations. That's very subjective. Um, so I, I hope we keep those things in mind as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have to adjourn both meetings. Yes. So why don't you do finance first? Okay, I uh, will adjourn the finance committee meeting and uh, see all of my fellow committee on Thursday. Is there a motion to adjourn the full council? I'll make a motion. And seconded? Second. That was added. All those in favor? <coughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Amherst Media. Oh, yeah.